All right, we're doing it. We are doing it. Katie, we're here. We're here. Darian, let's do it. We're here. <laughs> <laughs> let's do it. What did that coffee mug say? It said, enjoy the moment. Oh, yeah. Is that what it said? It says, enjoy the moment. It's my tea for the day. You know what? I love that. I really yeah. love that. I've been talking to all be my clients of that. about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was telling a few of my clients who are turning 50 and they look amazing. They feel, yeah. I said, you need to celebrate this. <clears throat> You're not here that long. You're really not here that long. I know. You better enjoy it. You know. I know. It's a really hard lesson to learn and a really, um, it's, it, I don't think it's realistic, you know, like I think we do our best to, to aspire to that. But, you know, if you tell me in my hardest mommy moments, oh, just enjoy every minute. It's going to pass so fast. I will punch you. <laughs> and, and then I'll be like, okay, no, I don't enjoy this one right now at all. Um, but I think it's, I think it's good to aspire to, uh, and just good to constantly have in your mind about, you know, making sure that yeah. you're really as present as possible, really trying to be as appreciative as possible. Parenting. How can you enjoy every moment of being a parent? It's impossible. <sighs> oh, yeah. There is it's literally moments. impossible. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. You know, it's, and it's OK. I think that, um, you know, there's there's a lot out there that says you're supposed to you're supposed you, you become mom, you become dad, like, you know, butterflies go out everywhere <laughs> and rainbows are everywhere. And um, it's messy it, like life. It's just me like like marriage and relationships, you know, like it's messy and it's it's real and lots of up, ups and downs. And, you know, you just do your best to show up every day and and, you know, ride the ride. <laughs> it's definitely a ride. It's up and down. It's I you always know, I wonder like why where this comes from where people try to paint a picture of this constant joy of different things like marriage and children or whatever it is. Where does where do you think that narrative comes from? I don't know. I mean, I feel like, you know, prior to social media, I'm sure that we had a lot more privacy. And so you didn't show you didn't you know what do they call it you didn't like show your dirty laundry right like that wasn't yeah. there was no space to really do that and you know maybe the more that there were sort of social interactions that's when you would find out the real dirt that's going out on you know like the moms groups who were getting together i call it the you know the the um the secret underground of the of the moms you know you don't mm. find out about it until you become a mom and then you realize there's actually a secret underground of moms <laughs> um and um that will tell you the real like not just the pretty but the, and there's a lot of pretty but we'll tell you the real but i feel like in this age of <clears throat> social media specifically i feel like there's been this big call to show you know like we've become less about doing and we've become more about showing um, as it relates to, you know, our relationship with social media. And so I feel like when we show, we as humans naturally don't want to air our dirty laundry, right? We don't <laughs> want to show you all the crap that we just went through. We don't want to show you and tell you about the massive depression we're in or the fight that we had with our spouse or the fact that your, you know, your kid is driving you insane and your hair is going gray. Like that's not, that's not pretty. And, you know, it's, it's not sexy, but so I feel like we, with all good intentions, we sort of show all the, the bright, you know, we show the good, we show the positive. And, and I think it's just sort of come into this space where that's, what's the norm. That's what's expected. Is it, you know, that's where you look good. Um, so I actually have a nice little heyday when I kind of, there's so much in me when I show up to social media, for example, like I want to make sure that like, no, I want to, I'm going to be real. Like I'm going to put on this. I oftentimes will take pictures. This is, you know, this has been a while now, but like, I would take pictures of me, like, you know, in front of the room that I was about to speak in front of. Right. And so like, Hey, snapshot of, you know, me about to speak. And then I would always put like, not included in this photo is, you know, my kid getting sick at school and, you know, needing to be called home. Mommy got two hours of sleep. I'm exhausted right now. I'm angry at the, <laughs> like, yeah. let me tell you what's actually really behind this. Um, so I'm grateful that there's a little bit more of that, but I think that that has a, that, that veneer that exists over there because social media is, is relatively integrated into our lives. Um, and I feel like there's this portion of like, we've started to believe that, that that's actually yeah. what our lives are and it's not well it's kind of like a rewiring of how people see themselves and other people in society and it's, it's the it's the interesting thing about creation of something 
without thinking what are the long-term consequences of societal norms and pressures right. that are creative. I think there's going to be a time in the future where we're going to look back and think this is a huge inflection point in humanity, like gigantic and it, 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 good and bad, <laughs> you know, with that. Yeah. So it, I'm curious how, well, meditation has become a larger role in the social media society and how you've seen that play out in, in your work and just observing it as well. Yeah, I, you know, I was introduced to meditation when I was 19 years old, I believe. Um, and I had never really heard about it before, but I was a student at Arizona State. I was doing a yoga class and those last five minutes of class when you're lying down and Shavasana position, just, you know, laying down on the floor, the, the guy or the yoga instructor took us through a guided meditation. And that was enough for me to get this taste of like, oh, wow, that was really cool. Like that felt really good. What was that? And that was enough for me to sort of continue this journey of, um, or, or to, to really kickstart a journey of just wanting more and finding out more. I would go to the library and go like find guided meditation books and CDs back then um, and, you know, fast forward, then I, there, I could get them on a website. I could actually like, you know, download those and get a meditation on a website. I was, you know, I would search local Buddhist centers to see like, oh, they're having a meditation, you know, series. Let me go check that out. I say all that because, you know, the, the big difference is, is that I feel like with social media or just our interconnectivity and our ability to see one another and connect so quickly is that um, now I feel like meditation, mindfulness are is, is really common and powerful and big. And I love that. Like that's actually a big giant positive yes. for these tools that we have is that something that is so beautiful and helpful and gives so much more light to the world can be shared and can be talked about and can be um, brought top to mind of so many people out there that, that, you know, other than individuals like me going to the library to kind of, you know, I heard about this thing or experienced this thing. Let me go find it. it. It was a slower motion of, of taking things on. Now it's all so fast. So I actually really love that about, about the way that our technology is now is that it's so readily available. Um, and for, for the good things, I think that that is really good. Yeah. It almost seems like this, almost hyper-connectivity has created a need for meditation or a larger need for spirituality, whatever it may be in people's lives, because they're basically inside, you're basically inside the matrix all the time. <laughs> you know, like, whereas in the past, I remember I'm 44. It's like, I remember just like not having connectivity regularly and, or not interacting with like a machine, a computer regularly. So right. I felt like I was, there was always a lot more peace in my life because I just didn't have that access all the time. But now we've democratized this so that most humans are constantly inundated with some form of connectivity. So it's like, when do you get out of that? And so that, yeah. I think, kind of created the space for it, you know? Yeah. And I believe that. Yeah. When I was a kid, there was a, a lot more, I would call it white space. Mm. Like there was just a lot more white space slash downtime there. You know, I, I clearly remember being a little girl telling my mom I was bored. Mom, I'm so bored. And she'd be like, you need to learn how to be bored. <laughs> exactly. She wasn't trying to fill me up with something that I could do that I needed to have my attention on. I, the, my parents did a really good job of that. And I feel like the, even as an adult now with this immediate connectivity, I have to proactively make sure that I have white space and I create white space where, you know, my, my mind isn't engaged in anything. It's not immediately connected and trying to even, even scrolling, they call it mindless scrolling. It's not mindless. It's your brain is ingesting things and things are happening. So, um, you know, I feel like with all of it, all of, we have easy access to it. And so now it's a matter of like, actually, how do I, how do, how do I actually take care of myself? How do I, how do I actually, you know, just like any good thing, like how do I mitigate what is coming in so that it's optimal for me rather than, oh, I have access to this thing. That means I could be on 24 hours a day. Well, actually that's not good for your optimal health. So yeah. 
how do you take the good out of it? Because I'm not going to sit here and bash so social media. I'm not going to bash our technology. I think it's amazing for so many reasons. And how do we take the best out of it? And that requires us to know ourselves know our own boundaries, know our own needs, know and be super aware of when we're interacting too much. Believe me, I know. I know when I'm like, I'm totally getting distracted, going on my social media platforms, getting distracted in my email because I don't want to do what I'm, what's in front of me. I know it. And so I think if we have that level of awareness, we, we can then take the next step, which is, okay, I'm going to, I literally will do this. So I write all my meditations so I will throw my phone across the room because it's a writing day <clears throat> and I will sit down and I'm sort of batch writing these, these poems that I'm writing that I turn into meditations and I will throw my phone across the room when I know that I have, when I know I can't keep it next to me without touching it. You know what I mean? Um, so that there's a boundary there and I make little rules for myself like, Hey, okay, when you're done with these two, then you can get up and you can go have a break. And if you feel like you want chicken, great. So yeah, I feel like it's, um, it's all of us knowing ourselves so that we know how to, to let us control how we want it to be in our lives. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's a great observation. I wonder like for meditation, I mean, I remember, again, I think if you're young, younger and listening to this, you may be like, this has always been a part of uh, my existence. I'm like, but mm -hmm. if you aren't in my age bracket or whatever, like this was considered almost like fringe type stuff back in the day. Why do you think it was considered that or maybe part of a more like, let's say, hippie based ideology back then? And but now I, I don't think I think we've gotten past that pretty far. Uh, it's more mainstream. Yeah. What was it about back then that caused that to be more of a fringe based idea? This there's I don't know if there's any science or data to back this up, but this is just sort of my observation. I feel that I'm 44 now. So when I was growing up, I feel like religion and being part of a religion um, and all these different churches satisfied that desire in individuals mm. to have a deep spiritual connect connection, right? Connection to a community, connection to higher, you know, your God, your higher self, your spirit, the universe. And I feel like that's the system that, that was in place that worked really well um, until it didn't, I think. And I think that there are there were enough people that were searching outside of those walls of that church so that you would discover ancient, <laughs> I say ancient, but like, you know, long meditation is not new. I mean, it's been around for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And so um, I feel like there was enough folks who dis would discover these tools, these ways of being, these different types. Uh, and by the way, I'm talking in my experience living in the United States. I mean, I'm sure this is, you know, different for folks in different countries. But because of that, I feel like as more and more of us have sought out to to fulfill and walk a spiritual life or to feel fulfilled spiritually. And, and, you know, that could be as basic as like, why am I here? What's my purpose? That kind of sense of needing to know and desiring to be fulfilled in this life. We search for answers. And I feel like at some point the, the churches are wonderful and there's enough people who have been searching outside of that. And so it has become more and more this is a tool, this is a tool, this is a tool, this is a tool. And we, more and more people talk about it. And now then, now we have all these ways to share. So I think it accentuates that. I think, you know what? I think it's an awesome observation. I mean, I can speak for myself. Like I've always had a very significant like church experience in my life. It's been positive. Like yeah, I feel like same. everybody that comes on my show, they're like terrible. It's been terrible. No. I'm like, man, I've had a really I, positive relationship. Same. And that, same. that does exist. I liked it like, yeah not like it's all bad just so you know but i've also combined that with my in inquisitive nature about other things like meditation um and other religions and cultures and and customs and i think all those things can actually exist at the same time Support one another exactly yeah i remember i was raised very catholic very very catholic 
And, um, and at some point in my young, young to mid twenties was the point where I started just sort of questioning some of that stuff. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't like, why is this the only thing, right? Like, what about this? And what, and thankfully I had parents who were very open-minded and, um, and, uh, I remember my dad saying one time, like, Katie, if there's a hundred people in the room, there's a hundred paths to God, you know, like doesn't really matter. So, so I grew up very Catholic, but also open-minded, inquisitive. Yeah. And at some point I started finding meditation. Uh, you know, I was pretty active in the, in the Buddhist, you know, sort of uh, like teachings in that regard. Um, you know, and I would just sort of like find, oh, I like this about Islam. I like this, like I would find these little things that really resonated with me in a bunch of different religions, bunch of different cultures, really. And I remember my mom saying one time, like, Katie, you can't just have your own buffet style religion. <laughs> and I was like, why? 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 Why can't I take the best of what works for me in all in and celebrate all of these different, really beautiful traditions and and, you know, ways of being and, and ways to, to, to really help myself blossom. Why can't I do that? And, you know, eventually she became a believer with me in, the, in that she really supports me just being my best self in whatever way that that needs to be for me. You think people are wired to seek out spirituality? <sighs> yes. Um, I think people are wired to want to to live this life as fully as they possibly can, or to, or to really understand why am I here? What is this all about? I really do. And then I believe kind of our typical culture takes over and, and asks us to go into boxes, you know, like, Hey, this is the box of get a good education, go to college, get married, have babies, get married, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. Hey, here's another box called this. And there are the sort of these, these templates, right? And so I don't think that it's innately bad or I don't think it's done with malintention. But what ends up happening is, you know, at some point we're really expected then to get into these boxes. Um, and I think that 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 ends up killing a lot of our creativity. It kills yeah. a lot of this desire to know ourselves, to be expressive um, because we're told like, oh, don't be too much. Don't be this, you know, because in that box, you're not this. Um, and so I feel like so many of us who are adults who are sort of really intensely on this journey is because we have probably fought those boxes and yes. been outliers for so long. And and I feel I think it feels so good when you you that I think now there's a lot of us and and when you connect, it's like, yes, and you realize there actually is no box. So I feel like as humans and as as spiritual beings having a human experience, mm-hmm. I feel like we innately know we are a soul. We are connected to this universe. We are connected to each other. We know that. And, hum- you know, the typical course of humanity, unfortunately, has us forget some of those things. So I feel like the work that we do is in remembering, remembering this stuff. And yeah. it's so easy to get sidetracked with these things that that are sort of expectations of having a successful human life right having the family set up the job the the money the kids like all of these things and and so I think our work I'll speak for myself my work is in making sure that I'm regularly deconstructing all of this stuff because I have a life that looks very traditional in a lot Mm. of ways but I am not a traditional soul. Like, mm. so I, I have to deconstruct and say, what do I actually want in accordance with my soul and what's right for me? And let me now go build that. Let me have my buffet style life, right? Um, versus, and I'm going to make my own script. And instead of this one that was sort of put out there for me, you know, years ago, I'm not going to have that script. And I feel like all of us, have the capability to the, jump out of the script, jump out of the box. And for some, it's very painful. For some, they'll stay in that box forever. And that's fine with only little glimpses into like, yeah. eh, I don't know. But um, it's hard work. It's it's really hard work to really kind of like jump out of that matrix, right? I think that's what we're struggling with. I've really thought about this is a lot of the uh, conflict and division and difficulties. Like when you're, when you're, 
deconstructing society. And I feel like a lot of this is just a deconstruction of society. It's like, uh, let's say something, you could pick a topic, let's say tattoos, right? How long were tattoos like, no, you can't do this. It's pretty much mainstream at this point. How long was smoking acceptable on planes? And then it's, now it's like, when you see somebody smoke, you're like, why? Like, I like, it's well, like you know, people smoke still. People still do this? <laughs> yeah. so like, you know, it's like, we're always yeah. we're breaking down these things. And, and now that is that has gone even a larger leap into things such as meditation, what it, whether, whether it's I, personal identity and self, clothing. And if you look back at shows and people and like in the 50s and 60s, everybody's wearing the same thing. Yeah. Everybody's walking the street in a major city in a suit and a dress, which is fine. It's the time. But like maybe those people didn't feel like they could flex their individuality during a time when there was conformity and all those right. things, you know, right. and especially think about for women too. like it's it's mind blowing for women and people and underrepresented populations. The recent past that we have had to endure. I mean, women couldn't vote that that long ago. I mean, it's yeah. crazy. I know. And there are separate bathrooms for people like me. If I existed at a different time, we wouldn't even be talking to each other. <laughs> like I always, I always said, thank God I was born in this particular era because if I was born back, you know, in the medieval ages, like I would be the Joan of Arc. Like, don't, <laughs> don't f with me. Like, That's exactly I will, right. I'm gonna do my my thing, right? Yeah. But it, it is a lot easier now to be your in to be individually expressive. You know, yes. I think it's a lot easier, thankfully. Um, and yeah, I, I but I, I also feel like you have to put all of those things in the context of the timeline. Right. You think about tattoos like, OK, before it was sort of, you know, even back when we were young, before it was, um, you know, the rebels got them. Yeah. And, but even before that, they have been part of, you know, cultural traditions right. in so many different beautiful cultures. And it's like, OK, so like every every sort of like, quote unquote, social norm that we're trying to either uh, uphold or dismantle yeah. is, is so within the context of the times. That's right. You know, it's funny. It's kind of like this conversation about like time travel and people are like, oh, I want to go backwards. I'm like, that doesn't benefit me, I, by the way. No. <laughs> like if I go back 100 years, it's no good for me. Nobody right? thinks about it that way. I'm like, I'll go to the future. Yeah. Right, I'm good now. But like, how would it benefit me to go back 200 years? Like I would immediately go back and it would be bad for me. Yeah. Like how, I mean, how would that benefit me? Like, <laughs> yeah. And I feel like knowing that or having an awareness of that and knowing we're actually not that far away from it helps me have an enormous amount of appreciation for where I am now and what I am doing, yeah. not what I get to do, but how easy it is for me to, to, to be my full self. Um, because, you know, in direct relation to, you know, my business and the meditation network, I had the idea for the women's meditation network back in early 2018. I was already a podcaster at the time. I already had a different podcasting business that had been in existence for years. So it wasn't new to the space. And when I had the idea of, oh, hey, I want to create a, a meditation podcast for women, um, I did what I should do, right? Like I went and searched on all the podcast players, typed in meditation, women, and one podcast existed. One. It was called Transcendental Meditation for Women. That was the only podcast out there in 2018. Wow. That was in 2018. We're talking, you know, what are we in? That's five years ago. So, um, and transcendental is a very specific type of meditation. That's now right. that's worked really well for me because I immediately was like, oh, I'm going to own this space. I can't believe that no one has owned this space yet. I'm going to own it. And, um, and so, you know, there are still things like that where I'm like, okay, I still, I, I am aware enough of, you know, how things might have been in the past to not want to live there. I don't want to live there. I don't want to even have any negative emotional attachments to it. I'm definitely not the person who screams out, oh, women only make 70 cents to the dollar men. Like that ain't me. I am absolutely not the person that you're going to ever hear about poor women. Like that sucks. I don't live there. Where I want to live is in what is now, what is what what are the possibilities now? And if there are things that need to have more light on them for 
groups who have not been represented enough, like I'm it right now. Like, let me dive in for in my little niche, right? Let me dive in and do that. Yay for me. And yay for all the people, all the women out there who get to benefit from that. That's wild. In 2018, one. That right. is how far have we come in five years? Like, and it now feels it's, like meditation's everywhere. It's on Netflix. Yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, <laughs> Meditation itself was definitely there back in 2018. It was absolutely there. Definitely not as much as it is now. I mean, yeah. it's it's awesome how many meditation podcasts are out there now. But but meditation and women, no, that did not that one podcast four 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 years ago, five years ago. Wow, that's yeah. that's insane. Actually, yeah. now yeah. let's get in specifically to meditation. What are the biggest misconceptions about meditation that you have seen? Uh, like observed or, you know, chatting with people about it. Yeah. The number one most common misconception is that meditation has to look like the person sitting in the lotus position, erect back, you know, closing your <laughs> eyes. And it has to be that your mind is clear. That's the biggest misconception. Most people will stop at their first meditation because they're like, well, my mind wasn't clear. Like I had the meditation playing and my mind didn't clear and it was just going. I was like, because that's your mind's job. Your mind's job is to create thoughts and we're not going to stop that. We're going to get you into the practice of allowing yourself to observe that those thoughts are actually not you. So now there's this space that's created between this thinking mind and self. And if you can observe those things, then the thoughts that are naturally happening during a meditation practice, you can just watch them sort of, you know, floating by like clouds in the sky or, or, you know, leaves down a stream instead of attaching to those thoughts and letting them run their course. So, you know, that's the biggest misconception is that it has to look like this thing. And my mind has to be blank. Um, it doesn't, your meditation could look like you laying down on the floor, laying on your bed. It could be just sitting in the car. Uh, it could be walking in nature. It, it, there are so many types of meditation. To me, my most basic definition of meditation is really that meditation is a pause for the purpose of creating that space, right? And so that can look like a lot of things. Interesting. Could, uh, well, this is interesting. Maybe could a conversation be a meditation? Hmm. I would say that it would be a form of meditation in that um, a lot of people have asked about like exercise. Yeah, I feel like I kind of have a meditative experience when I exercise. Yes. Um, I think that meditation really is a moment that allows you to to connect with self. So if it's conversation that does that, great. It typically isn't because you're usually so engaged with somebody else. But you know, meditation really is like that moment or the moments where you get to connect with self because you're you're sort of allowing yourself to be in that stillness separate from the thoughts. Um, and in that stillness, that's actually when you start hearing very clearly the mm. voice of your soul. Hey, Katie, you know, don't do this. Make sure you do that. This is really important. Go apologize to your husband. Don't yell at your kids. <laughs> <laughs> you know things like that. So I don't. I don't know. I'm. I'm. I'm not opposed to a conversation being a meditative experience. Um. You know, if, if it has those elements. It, it's just you know I feel like meditation somewhat intersects with the concept of flow. Uh, Chick Semihai famously came up with this. It feels like it's very similar. Time slows down on some level. You're very aware of your of what's going on internally. Everything feels different. You know, is this kind of almost altered state of consciousness in many ways? And I feel exercise is, a, I mean, this is my field, but exercise has always felt like a meditation for me. Like I've never felt centered sitting down on a mat. Mm -hmm. Like, And I've tried many, many times throughout. I'm like, this feels not like me. Yeah. But also, like, I'm very weird. Like, when I exercise, no music. I yeah, don't same. I don't like the same. distraction. It's a distraction. Yeah. Yeah. And I recognize for other people, they get in sync with it. But for me, like, that's a time where I actually go very deep within myself for that. Yes. So yeah. I, I have I've always connected that way in a meditation like that. And I think for other people, they need permission to know that that's a possibility. Yeah. And that's exactly why it's the biggest misconception. So to, the opposite of that is like, 
anything you want to be a meditation that feels meditative, that feels like you're pausing, that feels like you're connecting with with yourself physically, mentally, that you're that you're getting in tune with yourself is can be considered a meditation. So so don't get hung up on, okay, this is what it needs to look like. And it needs to be one more task that I check off my checklist in the morning. And so I can't do it. So therefore I'm not successful at doing it. So done. I'm not a meditator, right? So it, <laughs> yeah. it can be whatever. My husband needs to move. Like he's not the guy to sit down. Yeah. He absolutely can't do that. He does walking meditations all the time. And it's it usually looks like him just walking out in nature. We have a mm. lot of, we're here in Florida. We have a lot of nature trails, lots of um, green space. And so he'll just go out there half of the time he's on the phone because he mm -hmm. needs to be talking through some ideas. Mm -hmm. So actually, you know, your idea of the conversation being very meditative, he's he's an idea. He needs to talk through ideas. He needs to. That's how he makes sense of the world, makes sense yeah. of his world. And then he'll get off the phone and continue in nature and sort of like come back to presence in that way. Those are his meditations and they're incredibly valid. Yeah, I, I think that's beautiful, actually. And I'd, I'd like to break that stuff with people because I think. I don't know whether who or what has kind of promoted this idea that you have to be in this room and you have to be sitting down and you have to have your eyes closed. It's very, it's just, it's kind of like prayer is kind of a meditation too. Same. But exactly. how do you pray? Right. Is there like, yeah. is the prayer have to be this certain way type of yeah. thing? And I think we're breaking these expectations or the system of how this is supposed to be done. Yeah, same. You know, so I, I love breaking down these these ideas with that. Now, with podcasting, how has that increased meditation in your life or in other people's lives? Has it essentially made it more accessible and available to a lot of the people um, that are using these mechanisms you're working with? Yeah, so for the end user, for the woman listening, um, Yes, it is just immediately available to them, right? And this is why I love technology. I absolutely benefit from technology being so wonderful um, because any anyone can go on their phone, go on any you know podcast app, or they could go on my website. Like if they don't, if I don't listen to the podcast app. Okay, great. Um, you know, but they could literally press play and listen right now. So it's so easily accessible. Again, so much more than, you know, when I was in college looking and getting, you know, checking out CDs in the library. Um, <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> for, yeah, I know. Um, for me, as the creator of this, the reason why it's so powerful is because it has, you know, if you look at the titles of these meditations that I create, you will see the the story of my life. And what I feel like I have been able to practice doing, and I feel like I've gotten really good at doing this, always learning to be better, but I feel like I've gotten really good is being able to sort of write a very poetic experience about, you know, a high, a low, a challenge, a good thing, um, sort of universal truths, whatever that is. And, and I can translate that into words that allow someone else to feel like it's their words. So much like, um, much like a music artist, you know, like a, a songwriter where, you know, you, if I can, if I asked you to think of like a song that really spoke to you, you can remember those lyrics. You can remember probably where you were the first time you heard them, or you can remember an era of your life that they really typically like ring home true for. So much like that, I feel like for me, writing these is is seriously a form of meditation for me because it is the gathering of all of those feelings and emotions and thoughts and being able to sort of like birth them into this beautiful poem that I now know that people will be able to really connect with, resonate with, own, and and be impacted by, which is really why I'm doing this. That is the beating heart of why I do what I do. So, you know, it makes it their, you know, technology makes it more accessible to them. For me, it's a meditative experience for me and a new a new season of my meditation journey that I can share with other people. What's what do you think the future of meditation is? I mean, if you just look forward, I mean, no one knows the future and we're horrible at predicting the future, but it's fun to think about. I know. <laughs> What's the future of meditation in your mind? Oh, goodness. Um, I am. I'm not too sure, actually. I feel like um, 
I feel like it is more of a, a an integrated part of our lifestyle, meaning it's not something I go do, but it's really because of a regular meditation practice, I'm constantly sort of hyper self-aware and I can know that I need to take these five breaths before I go into my screaming kids. I know, <laughs> you know, like uh, basically that it's so, it's so much more like an active part of our life and how we do things. And in relation to others, um, it, it would be great. I'm just sort of dreaming here, but it'd be great if like, that's part of our interaction with each other. Like, and I feel like, mm. again, in sort of ways, you know, in the churches, it was very common. So like, you go over to your friend's house for, you know, families go over to this family's house and you sit down and you're praying before the meal, right? That doesn't really happen nowadays unless you are in the same church community together. So I feel like it could be that level of connection in that we're having a communion of this and we can speak in these ways that are very um, uh, universal in, in that, like we're, we're experiencing meditation in our lives together. You know what I mean? So like we're, we're able to stop, you know, we're all together at a get together and we we're able to stop and talk about the beauty of the sunset, you know, like that it sort of happens now, but I would love more of a, of a consciousness that's brought to the everydayness of our interactions. That's one of the best answers I've ever heard to that question. I'm serious. <laughs> like I may, it made me think about this incredible parallel of an idea that people talk about it, which is this uh, integration of technology, the singularity of technology and humans merging together. But I never thought about that for meditation. Mm. That essentially, that same thing is probably actually happening now in its infancy, where maybe the buildings we go into, the activities we participate in always have some element of a meditative pause or the design of a construction is created to be meditative when you show up type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? I think that's probably, sure I, already, I see it, yeah. it's happening. I think it's, <laughs> it's happening. I think it's happening it's like, somewhere, you know, it's just like, I mean, truthfully, the fact that we're having more and more conversations about meditation right. we, and the conversations actually are not about meditation itself. Really. It's actually about how meditation is enacted in our lives. And what yeah. it actually looks like and what the benefits actually, how they actually show up. Like, what are the realities of that? So it's just more of that, you know, like more normalcy of the meditation speak and, <laughs> and, you know, the, the co-living of the benefits of meditation. Yeah. It's actually interesting because it makes me think I was telling my wife the other day, it's like, I've done so many of these and I'm thinking about like, I can tell when I talk to someone who is their frequency is more meditation, yoga, psychedelics, cannabis, there's a different speak. There's a mm. different aura about that person. And I can tell when they have none of that or whatever, mm. they're not thinking on that plane. It's a, it's a very, it's a very different conversation. It, it's a good conversation. It's just, there's, there's a different feeling with the person, yeah. you yeah. know, it, yeah. That vibration or whatever you want to call it feels very different, the frequency. And I feel like we're creating this frequency where people are like, you know what? I'm tired of not talking about my feelings. You know, right. how has this helped people? Like right. not talking, it has not helped people. It hasn't helped fathers, right. mothers, daughters. It's never helped anyone. Right. And connecting better to the self and higher versions of the self and different things. That, and I think we're fighting with these, this terminology. Like, I'm curious about this. I'm very curious what you think about this is I would say one out of every three people that come on this podcast talks about the universe and the manifesting. And yeah. I feel like we're fighting through what the hell are we talking about with this? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm I, saying? <laughs> like, I think you nailed it on the head. Actually. I think it's just a, a, a vocabulary issue, right? I think, we're, I think we're, I mean, truth, truth be told, my personal belief is that, you know, whatever church religion, uh, historical, you know, group, you know, uh, whatever sect you have of people, I feel like in relation to sort of a higher power, I feel like we're all, t we're all saying the same thing. We just have different languages for it. We just have different <laughs> words for it. I really do believe that. Um, 
And I remember asking my dad as a young kid, like, um, you know, in my town, you were either Catholic or Mormon. Mm. And I remember asking my dad, like, dad, so what happened? And I had, a, you know, for a couple months, I had like the Mormon boyfriend. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so I remember asking my dad, like, dad, so what do you think happens? You know, when Catholics die, we go here. Like, what do you think happens when, you know, somebody who's Mormon dies? And he goes, everyone is going to experience whatever they believed and like whatever belief system that they were believing, like great. And it works, but there's something even bigger at play. That's actually yes. universal. And this is why I, I, I refer to it, her, whatever, as the universe, my God, as the universe is because there's something that is more universal at play than none of us can actually really comprehend because it's, we are it, we are, we are a part of it. We are connected to it. We are it. Um, and so we've just come up with these little languages and there's a lot of them, lot. Um, but we're all really talking about the same damn thing, right? Like yeah. kindness, love, you know, be good to other people, do the work to become the best version of yourself. Uh, you know, don't make too much of a mess <laughs> and, you know, there, and, and feel that connection. And when you, you know, in the manifestation, it's like calling in that energy and, you know, being at that frequency, like literally it's just different terms for <laughs> a lot of the same stuff in Probably my humble it, opinion. I'm telling you. People yeah. are struggling. It's, but I love talking about this because like a lot of times people never question the things people say. They yeah. just say stuff. So like, I, I like doing that. I'm never mean about, it. I was, I'm just yeah. curious. Yeah. I'm just like, well, when you say the universe, it brought you this like like the universe is made up of like atoms and you know and hydrogen like are you are you assigning like sentience to that like what do you mean like you know what's funny and often they've never thought about it yeah they've yeah. never thought about it i'm like i'm just saying it's like like what does that mean like mm -hmm. or manifesting like that's like a very big buzzword in our society it's like well what is that what does that mean like are you just sat here and you thought good thoughts and things happened. I'm like, mm. <laughs> no, no. you know, there are there is action that has to happen yeah. too. You know, yeah. It's like, yeah. I just like people to explain themselves, and yeah. and I think you get you get a deeper meaning when you actually question and look through the things that you believe in. I if agree. You don't you're just like automatic all the time, and you don't really know what you're saying. You know, so like, what yeah. is the universe? I'm like to a scientist, it's very different than someone who believes in God or to a farmer, you know, to a hiker. Well, like, what does that mean? Like, right. And the only person that it is important who really understands crystal clear what that meaning is, is yourself, because right. it's going to differ from you. And it's going to differ from even those people that you really love and who love you, you know, my, and, and so I struggled for a long time coming up with what word I wanted to choose and use for this sense of a higher, higher being, right. A higher, um, higher energy spirit, whatever it is. I really, as you could hear, I still really, mm -hmm. um, I will go through the, the list. Should I call it God? Should I, but like, should I call it universe spirit? Because at the end of the day, I like, I could feel what that is for me. Right. I think that this is a feeling most of us have where we could feel what this, what, how God works in our lives, how this, this energy that, that reminds us that we are not just human, right. That right. we are not just a body. I think right. most of us know what that, like have felt that. Okay. So whatever you call that doesn't matter. What matters is that you have an understanding of how you're going to refer to that and how you're going to dance with that in your life. And, and my verbiage has changed over the years too. It's evolved. Like, you know, I, I, I like, tr I'm trying, I've tried on the different words and how I'm going to refer <laughs> to it. And, um, and I, and, and then there's, you know, there's some times where I'm just like, Oh, that's too much. Like spiritual speak. Like I, that doesn't, that doesn't really <laughs> fit with me either. So, um, so I think that, you know, it's important for us to understand that for ourselves and to know that that can always be evolving and changing just as we are um like the but that the language itself is actually less important than it yeah. this us me yeah. right it, the language is is not that important
It's interesting. I, I feel this, my personal point of view is that a lot of humans are waking up to the idea that there is more than the physical nature of the self, that we are, that is a much larger aspect of that, that the, we are spiritual beings living a very finite physical existence. I feel like that, if you said that like a long time ago, they'd be like, okay, that's reserved for a very small, you know, for a certain population of people. But I think in general, humanity is starting to embrace this idea. It, it just, I don't know, if you stood and you looked at the ocean, it's hard not to believe that, man. You know, right. like, and you saw the mountains and you saw, I mean, it's very difficult to assign randomness to things for me personally, you know. Yeah, that's, you know, um, I will have people ask me a lot, like how I get through tough times in relation to meditation, right? And what I'll, uh, what I will always say is I, I go to nature. I get my feet in nature, like I'm standing in the grass or I'm on the beach or I'm just, you know, at minimum walking, looking up at the trees, whatever I can get, because what it does is it simultaneously reminds me how important I am. Like it reminds me that there's no one else in this world, just like me, no one, which sort of kills all the self-doubt comparison. It kills all that stuff. Right. So like, there's no one just like me. I'm the only Katie Kremitzos living this life in this particular time. Like that's it. And I'm one piece of this massive, totally beyond imagination tapestry that is the world slash universe slash life. Right. And that's humbling. That's very humbling that that simultaneous get, gives me like, I'm special, but you're not really that special, but right. you're special, but you're not really that special. Like, <laughs> um, uh, and it, to me, that's very grounding because same thing. You can't, you can't look at the ocean. You can't look at the sun. You can't look at the moon, this beautiful full, full moon we had recently. Like you can't look at that and not be in awe at, at, mm -hmm at all of this and not understand that's just a small piece of something even greater. Yes. Oh, these, these are the best conversations. I'm telling you, they, they're just it. so rich with things that are bigger than, than just life in general. They're so big. I, thank you for giving me some of your time, Katie. I really appreciate it. Uh, and, uh, you are so welcome. This is such a beautiful, refreshing conversation. I know, right? It feels good, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Feels good. I know. Well, listen, uh, please tell all the wonderful people how they can connect with uh, your network and all the different podcasts you're doing and the yeah. wonderful uh, kind of universe you've created with all that. Yeah. So whatever podcast player you're listening to now, just go type in meditation for women. Um, all of my 10 podcasts now will come up. Um, there's a variety, sleep meditations, morning meditations, daily affirmations, sounds, you name it. We got it. Meditation for anxiety, healing meditation. Um, and just go subscribe and go look through the, they're meant to be this massive library of meditations for you. So, you know, go through, scroll through, see what you need to hear and, you know, press play and have a listen. Press play. That's what I say all the time. Just press play, yeah. see what yes. happens, you know? Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Katie. I appreciate your time. Darian, you're amazing. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you.